after an invigorating inaugural session and plenary talk. It is now time for a literary discussion on Shakespearean characters. This session will be a brief talk by Dr. B. Venkat Ramana. Dr. B. Venkat Ramana is an assistant professor in the Department of English, Language and Literature at Sri Satya Institute of Higher Learning at its Muddhahali campus. He has a brilliant career and enjoys literary and research experience. He has, to his credit, publishing a couple of research articles in national and international journals of good repute. He is also accommodated on the editorial board of some. His areas of specialization include new literature and literary criticism and theory. In this session, he will be talking to us on the topic Greying Characters of Mounting Spirit. He will base his talk on aging characters of Shakespeare who exhibit an immense grit and courage in the face of challenges. Over to Dr. Venkat Ramna. Om Shri Sai Ram. Attributing everything to the will of the great taskmaster, Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, and invoking his blessings. I begin this talk, Greying Characters of Mountain Spirit in Shakespeare's Place, for the webinar series on life, language and literature, brought to you by the Department of English Language and Literature, Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning. And this grey spirit, yearning and desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star, beyond the utmost bound of human thought, old age hath yet his honour and toil, Death closes all, but something before the end, some work of noble note may yet be done. Made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find and not to yield. The above lines of Tennyson from his epic poem, Ulysses, strike the chord of harmony with Shakespeare's galaxy of aging stars that emerge at the crescendo of human experience evolving in the soulful deliberations of the great part of heaven. These men occupy the center stage of Shakespeare's place and engage the heart's affections of the audience, evoking rousing reception for the poet and his works. They leave to the critics and readers layers of stratification, revealing the inexplicable web of God, the mystery of life. However, aging in Shakespeare is not chronological but psychological. Characters seem to age in relation to the logic of the dramatic action rather than the logical progression of the narrative. The oldest have borne most. We are young, shall never see so much, nor live so long. At their prediction kinglier, hence aging is inevitable and indispensable for the flowering of human life. The quintessence of Shakespeare's great plays is wrapped in the images of these graying characters. Shakespeare wants us to pay attention, not to the calendar, but to the inner growth of his characters, like Hamlet. Hamlet seems much older than he did when the play began, not because he looks different, but because of the newfound maturity that allows him to look calmly on death. If it be now, it's not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. The talk centers around Shakespeare's aging stars like Lear in King Lear, Polonius a political old man in Hamlet, Duke Senior a wise old man and philosopher in As You Like It, Adam an ideal and devoted old servant in the same play, Gonzalo an old lord exuding a sweet reasonableness in The Tempest, King Henry IV and Richard II, men of special wisdom in the plays named after them. Lastly, Portia's dead father, in the merchant of Venice. King Lear. King Lear is cosmos falling into chaos. So are Othello, Macbeth and Paradise Lost. But they do not match King Lear. King Lear is the unique eminence in the earth's literary art. Lear is so grand a literary character that he tends to defy direct description. 
Nearly everything worth saying about him needs to be balanced by an antithetical statement. King Lear, most comprehensive of dramas, shows us only one character so free and is anything but a great soul. Beyond the scale of everyone else in this drama, Lear is as much a fallen mortal god as he is a king. Lear is loved as well as feared by everyone in the play who is at all morally admi admirable. Cordelia, Kent, Gloucester, Edgar, Alban, those who hate the king are monsters of the deep, Gondel, Regan, Cornwall. These days, paternal love and filial love are not exactly in critical fashion and most younger Shakespeareans do not seem to love Lear or Shakespeare for that matter. And yet it is difficult to find another Shakespearean protagonist as deeply loved by other figures in his or her place as Lear is loved by Kent, Cordelia, Gloucester and the Fool and by Edgar and Albany as well. Lear may seem as violent, irascible and unpredictable as the biblical J. writers Yavi on whom he is based, but clearly he has been a loving father to his people, unlike the original Yavi. In spite of his despair and self-pity, Lear is revealed as a complex man, one whose punishment far exceeds his foolish errors and thus Lear is deserving of the audience's sympathy. Eventually, Lear displays regret, remorse, empathy and compassion for the poor, a population that Lear has not noticed before. Lear focuses on the parallels he sees to his own life and so, in a real sense, his pity for the poor is also a reflection of the pity he feels for his own situation. Lear is the anointed king, <coughs> God's representative and thus he shares the responsibility for dispensing justice on earth. He recognizes that he bears responsibility for both his own problems and for those of others who suffer equally. His understanding of his complexity in the events that follow is a major step in accepting responsibility and in acknowledging that he is not infallible. Because of his own suffering, Lear has also learned that even he is not above God's justice. King Lear is the play closest to the idea of anagnosis or recognition in Aristotle's poetics. In other words, like other tragic protagonists, Lear hath ever but slenderly known himself. By an inevitable process, Lear moves past blindness and suffering through self-knowledge. According to the map he has in front of him, he will divide his kingdom into three parts in order to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl toward death. Lear is preoccupied with his age and he seems to acknowledge that he is no longer capable of ruling his kingdom. The image of crawling toward death is the first of many references, suggesting second childhood. The theme of infantilization becomes more obvious in his relations with Gondril and Regan, but it is especially pronounced in Lear's dealings with the fool. Lear speaks of the division of the kingdom as an act of divestiture, both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state. At the end of the last scene of the play, it seems as if Kent, like Gloucester and Lear, will die. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The play ends with Edgar's couplets, separating the young from the old. The oldest have borne most, we that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. Edgar makes it seem as if the conflict between young and age is the tragic theme of the play. The oldest, like Lear and Gloucester, have borne most, meaning that they have suffered and experienced the most. The young shall never be able to live life as fully as Lear and Gloucester or attain the tragic wisdom that comes through suffering. When Edgar says that the young will not live so long, he seems to imply not that they will not live so many years. Lear is fourscore and upward 
but that they will not lead such profound and meaningful lives. Thus, Edgar concludes with a plangent couplet that intimates a universal decline. It is as if the death of the father king god has removed the only figuration that participated neither in origin nor in end. Polonius Shakespeare reveals an interest in developing characters of politic old men like Polonius in Hamlet, Nestor in Troilus and Cressida, and Menenius in Coriolanus. These characters are old men who have acquired wisdom from long experience. They are skillful rhetoricians and orators, yet they are also unscrupulous in their moral commitments. Shakespeare is fascinated by the type of the sensex from Roman comedy, which he develops in the many heavy fathers in his works. As represented in many theatrical productions, Polonius comes across as a foolish, talkative old man, yet he is also very important politically. He is the king's chief counselor and it seems fairly obvious that he has helped Claudius to ascend the throne. He congratulates himself on his correct, but perhaps over-calculating shrewdness characteristic of an old man when he is absolutely convinced of Hamlet's mad love of Ophelia. By heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. He doesn't think too much of the reasoning powers of young people like his son and daughter. The next scene, he appears before the king and queen full of self-congratulation that he has found the cause of Hamlet's madness. He preens with self-importance and insists that the king should first admit the ambassador from Norway at which point my news shall be the fruit to the great feast. Shakespeare goes to great pains to write a parodistic rhetorical oration for Polonius like the parody of fancy rhetoric and diction spoken by Osric in Act 5 scene 2. Polonius has studied his speech carefully to the point where it almost sounds memorized. It has a very formal introduction which doesn't get to the point for quite a few lines. It is quoted it at length to give the reader some idea of its rhetorical expansiveness. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night and time is time were nothing but to waste night, day and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Although the speech is comprised of inanities, it is a well-turned and sonorous rhetorical period of courtly diction. There is an immediate implicit criticism that the queen says, more matter with less art. But Polonius swears that he uses no art at all. Art, of course, is the art of rhetoric as opposed to plain speaking. Once started, Polonius cannot be dissuaded from delivering his prepared oration. With extraordinary art, he swears that he uses no art at all. In other words, that he speaks directly and to the point. That he is mad, it's true, it's true, it's pity, and pity, it's it's true, a foolish figure. But farewell it, for I will use no art. The figure refers to the art of rhetoric discussed in many elaborate treatises of Shakespeare's time. In reading Hamlet's badly conceived love letter to Ophelia, Polonius shows himself to be something of a literary critic. He objects to Hamlet's salutation to the most beautified Ophelia. That's an ill phrase, a wild phrase. Beautified is a wild phrase, of course. Beautified suggests that Ophelia is not naturally beautiful but relies on cosmetics. The plastic art, like the Harold's cheek, in the king's confessional aside. In Act 1, Scene 3 of Hamlet, the character of Polonius prepares his son Laertes from travel abroad with a speech in which he directs the youth to commit a few precepts to memory. Among these precepts is the now familiar adage, neither a borrower nor a lender be. And the dictum, this above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow 
as the night the day thou canst not be false to any man the occasion of the speech has been established in advance for in the previous scene polonius has told the king and queen that he has granted his son permission to extend his studies in france this seems to be an eminently reasonable decision by a father concerned with his son's welfare and the moralisms that comprise the speech in question sound good instead the phrase to thine own self be true remains in widespread circulation today having resounded through the ages in such literary works as henry ibsen's play brand duke senior if old men often carry negative connotations in shakespeare a number of almost ideal wise old men speak to us out of their rich and varied experience this is a traditional and biblical view of old men as sages and reverend counselors these wise old men he lives in pastoral exile in the forest of arden as if he were still in the golden age his philosophy seems to be expressed in the following statement sweet are the uses of adversity which like the tod ugly and venomous were yet a precious jewel in his head he contrasts the tranquil sweetness of life in the forest with the painted pomp at the envious court in the forest you senior and his co-mates and brothers in exile have escaped from the penalty of adam or original sin they are like polexenis and leontis in the winter's tale playing like twin lambs that did frisk in the sun who knew not the doctrine of ill doing nor dreamed that any did the life of duke senior and his co-mates has a sacramental quality it finds tongues in trees books in the running brooks sermons in stones and good in everything old adam the royal and generous servant of orlando in the play is more fully presented as another wise old man he is by his own admission almost four score a little younger than king lear and he is represented as an ideal type of the devoted servant orlando speaks an encomium for him oh good old man how well in thee appears the constant service of the antique world when service sweet for duty not for meat adam is not only old but also old fashion and he lords the virtues of an older time he freely offers all and 500 crowns which represents which represents the thrifty hire i saved under your father he boasts of his virility though i look old yet i am strong and lusty he attributes his heartiness to clean living for in my youth i never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood nor did with unabashful forehead who the means of weakness and debility he is an ideal type of the old man whose age has not like macbeths fall into the sear the yellow leaf old adam's age is a lusty winter frosty but kindly interestingly shakespeare is reputed to have played old adam gonzalo gonzalo in the tempest is an old lord who exudes a sweet reasonableness in the cast of characters he is listed as an honest old counselor we see him first during the tempest at the beginning of the play despite the storm he manages to maintain his patience and good humor at the very end of the scene when the ship has split in half and everyone is drowning sorry drowning he wittily remarks now would i give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground long heath brown furs anything the wills above be done but i would fain die a dry death he is a true believer in providence in prospero's long expository speech to mirinda in the next scene we again see gonzalo in a positive and beneficial light in the rotten carcass of a butt given to prospero and his daughter in their exile from milan gonzalo out of his charity provides them with good fresh water and rich garments linens stuffs and necessaries to advance prospero's art or magic gonzalo of his gentleness supplies the magician 
with the necessary tools of his craft knowing i loved my books he furnished me from my own library with volumes that i prize above my duke down prosperous brother antonio who has usurped his kingdom and sebastian his co-conspirator and brother of the king of naples make fun of gonzalo whom they call old cook and this ancient morsel this sir prudence by his own admission he is an old man whose old bones ache but his presentation of his ideal commonwealth is full of imagination and exuberance it owes an obvious debt to montaigne but it is also related to other contemporary utopias being full of heterodox anarchistic and libertarian ideas in the commonwealth i would by contraries execute all things for no kind of traffic would i admit no name of magistrate gonzalo says that letters or learning should not be known and presumably that riches and poverty would then disappear his most unusual stipulations is that there be no occupation all men idle all and women do but in no certain pure no sovereignty it is a truly and an idealistic socialist vision all things in common nature should produce in some i would with such perfection govern sir to excel the golden age gonzalo's ideal commonwealth reproduces the golden age feeling of duke senior's pastoral kingdom in as you like it at the end of the play all members of the shipwrecked wedding party are prosperous prisoners including as aerial reports him that you term sir the good lord gonzalo his tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds prospero expostulates to everyone in his charmed circle but only gonzalo is exempt from recrimination holy gonzalo honorable man my eyes even sociable to the show of thine fall fellowly drops prospero is deeply moved and remembers gonzalo's kindness to him oh good gonzalo my true preserver and a loyal sir to him thou followest i'll pay thy graces whom both in word and deed presumably gonzalo accompanies prospero back to milan and resumes his high office in the state Henry IV Some characters in Shakespeare are not wise old men at the beginning of the play like Duke Senior old Adam and Gonzalo but are endowed with a special wisdom shortly before their deaths In Henry IV Henry is grievously sick in act 4 scene 4 and the next scene is his last he is dead by act 5 when his son Harry is invested as king Henry V shortly before his death Henry has an illuminating scene of reflection and quiet meditation. It begins with the king entering in his nightgown or dressing gown, followed by a long soliloquy. That is an apostrophe to sleep. As he explains to his son in a later scene, the king is suffering from a guilty conscience. God knows my son by what bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown and I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head as a result the king cannot sleep o oh, sleep o oh, gentle sleep nature's soft nurse how have i frightened thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my sense in forgetfulness sleep comes to all sorts of persons even in perilous situations like the ship boy upon the high and giddy mast but not to the king the conclusion is obvious then happy lo lie down uneasy lies the head that wears a crown the king is in unusually meditative mood reflecting the fact that he is near the end of his life he at first fancies the body of his kingdom how foul it is what rank diseases grow but then proceeds to a larger topic o oh god that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times his attempt to grasp the nature of history and his speculations are like macbeth's insistent questions to the witches though the treasure of nature's germen stumble altogether even till destruction sickens answer me to what i ask you 
This speech also recalls Sir Lear caught in the storm and asking, all shaking thunder, to crack nature's mouths, all Germans spill at once, that make ingrateful man. Germans are the seeds of all life. Thus, Henry is trying to establish some meaningful causation in the revolution of the times. But the role of chance is powerful. The king is filled with melancholy thoughts. How chance has mocks and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. Fortunately, one cannot predict the future. For if this were so, the happiest youth would shut the book and sit him down and die. Next, the king thinks of examples from his own reign, especially Northumberland. The man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot. Yet Northumberland eventually proves a traitor as Richard II, the man whom Henry deposed and had murdered, remembers so unforgettably in prophetic terms. Northumberland, though laddered by the witch, my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The king is trying to understand the revolution of the times that has brought him to the throne and now presages his imminent death. Warwick, an important counsellor to the king, completes his thoughts, bringing his speculations to a philosophical conclusion. There is a history in all men's lives, figuring the nature of the times deceased, the witch observed a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things, as yet not come to life, who in their seeds and weak beginning lie in treasure. Such things become the thatch and brood of time. It is interesting that Warwick uses the seed image which, continu which continues the idea of Germans. And this provides an explanation for the revolution of the times. The hatch and brood of time contains within it the shape of things to come. So a philosophical man may prophesy the main chance of things as yet not come to life. In other words, there is a preordained order of events. Despite appearances, things do not happen by mere chance, as evidenced by the image of the ladder in Richard II's prophecy about Northumberland. Henry IV, now sick and near death, at least he is reassured that what has happened during his reign are not mere random chance occurrences, but necessities. He is ready to meet them like necessities. Richard II. Richard II undergoes a strong transformation during the course of the play of the same name, after he has been deposed by Bolingbroke, who becomes King Henry IV, imprisoned and is about to be murdered. He becomes to a new philosophical awareness of his condition and the reality that surrounds him. While incarcerated in Pomfret Castle, he delivers a long meditative soliloquy. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet, I will hammer it out. By examining his thoughts, Richard tries to emerge from his microcosm, or little world, and to understand his present situation which will surely end in his imminent death. He sees himself somewhat historically as an actor playing many roles. Thus play I in one person many role, and none contented. Sometimes am I a king, then treason make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. The crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. He is actually conscious of being nothing like his earlier mournful thoughts when he was deposed. I have no name, a, no title, nor that name was given me at the font, but it's usurped. He has become a mockery king of snow. In his prison cell, he is preoccupied with his present pitiful and pitiable status. But whatever I be, nor I, nor any man, but man, is, with nothing shall be pleased, till he be eased with being nothing. He is preparing himself spiritually for death. In his soliloquy, Richard takes up images from the reality that surrounds him and analyzes them. He hears music that is out of tune and thinks, 
immediately of the music of men's lives. In his own life, he had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time and now doth time waste me. Richard next pursues images of time, specifically clock time. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. The sounds that tell the hour are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. In his grieving, Richard has become philosophical. When a groom of his stable appears to comfort him, Richard moralizes on his horse, Barbary, now ridden by Bolingbroke. His dear horse has no sense of loyalty to his former master, but Richard checks himself. Forgiveness, horse, why do I rail on thee, since thou created to be awed by man, wasn't born to bear, I was not made a horse, and yet I bear a burden like an ass. Spurred, God, and tried by John Singh Bolingbroke. At this late point in the play, when he is about to die, we sense that Richard has not only grown much older than he seemed earlier, but also much wiser. He is suddenly aware of his spiritual condition and he speaks philosophically like Hamlet in his soliloquies. Lastly, Portia's dead father. The wisdom of Portia's dead father in the Merchant of Venice, who has prescribed his daughter marry the suitor, who rightly chooses the casket containing her likeness. Portia is annoyed that she cannot choose a husband for herself. I may neither choose who I would nor refuse, who I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Nevertheless, she is determined to follow the dictates of her dead father. If I live to be as old as Sibla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. The episode of the three caskets has a folkloric quality, suggesting that everything will work out well in the end. Nerissa, her waiting gentlewoman, is certain of the rightness of Portia's father's imposition. Portia believes that the lottery of my destiny bars me the right of voluntary choosing. There is something magical, of course, in the fact that no suitor has thus far chosen the right casket. The Prince of Morocco opts for the gold and the Prince of Aragon for the silver, leaving only one unselected casket. We therefore, we therefore feel confident that Bassanio is certain to choose correctly. Nevertheless, the suspense is maintained even as Portia asserts the wisdom of her father's death. Wit or intellect to reassure Bessonio. If you do love me, you will find me out. It is clear that Shakespeare uses familiar imagery to reflect the ravages of time, with time depicted with the traditional hour glass and sith, a figure still encountered on New Year's cards. This imagery is almost obviously employed in the sonnets but it runs throughout Shakespeare's works in his representation of mutability, a strongly biblical theme. White hair and wrinkles are part of the often repeated iconography of aging. The physical infirmities of old age are all laid out in conventional images, very similar to the representation of old age in the 21st century. Yet, there is an abiding sense that old age also brings with it a degree of wisdom gained through a long and serious confrontation with life experience. Shakespeare's galaxy of aging stars continue to move the audience with their mounting spirit. Now it's the time to take questions from the audience. That was a scholarly analysis of Shakespearean characters. To think that what was written five centuries ago has relevance even today. Thank you Dr. Venkat Ramana for that brief but beneficial talk. We have here a few questions from the audience. One of the listeners has asked this question. What is the main theme or the main idea in Shakespeare's play King Lear? I think that the main theme is betrayal. The play shows how people like Lear can put their trust in the wrong people. It then goes on to show what the impact of betrayal is on the person who has been betrayed. Another question is, why is 
Polonius important? Polonius is a proud and concerned father. In his first line, he tells us he hesitates to let his son Laertes go abroad and draws out his last meeting with Laertes because he is reluctant to see him go. Wonderful, sir. Now let us take the third question. How are prose and poetry used in the play to indicate differences in social class? Well, as in Henry IV, uh, the noblemen and royalty almost always speak in poetry when they are alone. Falstaff, the country justices and their friends speak in prose. The noblemen often do not always speak in prose when they are around Falstaff. After Hall becomes King Henry V, he no longer speaks in prose. This indicates a difference between high and low social classes, although it is one that can change depending on the context. Very nice, sir. Uh, we have one last question. Why does Gonzalo present his idea of Commonwealth? Prospero thinks of it as the place he is king and reigns over and has complete dominion over. Gonzalo thinks of it as a commonwealth where he crowns himself. Kings also, but uh, later he sums, sums up the reasoning of a stateless state in the phrase. No sovereignty, which means no one will have dominion over anyone else. Thank you very much. We'll meet again in our next session. Till then, Namaste Sairam. Sairam. Sairam.